everyone welcome to another episode of the industry show i'm nitin bajaj and we are at the offices of pabrai funds with the maharaja of value investment monish pabrai monish thank you for joining us we really appreciate it well nitin you know i'm a huge fan of yours and rajiv oh, thank you rajiv sir <laughs> also it's a pleasure to be here thank you it's our pleasure so uh, you know obviously your your image and you know the photo that we had on our flyer you have a pretty badass look so i wasn't sure how to kind of come up with the questions but i did put in some some funny questions just to kind of ease up the conversation sure. so hopefully we'll be okay with that <laughs> <laughs> and i don't know if has anyone addressed you as the maharaja monish no that's a first i'll make sure my kids watch this okay <laughs> you should you know you have a junoon etf you i think there's that's a right. patent on it maybe you should get a a maharaja you know you have the demeanor you have the poise and and especially your your mustache it just just well we on. have a, we have a mascot you do uh, who looks something like that i should see it we should have <laughs> had it here we should yeah. have just well we haven't we haven't put him in our various avatars yet but but we will okay when you do i'll i'll just take it to my next show sure all right yeah. so you know before we go in and and start talking deep into the business side of things give us give us a quick background you know your childhood where did you go to school uh, what city did you grow up in sure yeah so i was uh, born and raised in india okay. and i spent uh, 10 years in mumbai and 6 years in delhi kind of going back and forth okay. it wasn't in two contiguous yeah. uh, periods and then uh, i finished high school in dubai mm-hmm. and uh, and then uh, then i came to the us for my undergrad and and so on so uh, indian childhood was mostly uh mumbai delhi my mm-hmm. uh my grandfather was a magician huh. so my uh, maternal uh, grandparents home was in dehradun in the foothills nice. so i spent a lot of summers in uh, uh dehradun and mussoorie and mm-hmm. that area so that was wonderful as well wow that's that's quite a unique background magic and the mystical mumbai and yeah uh, i delhi. was uh, yeah, i was even i think in a couple of magic shows uh, <laughs> i think i was 12 uh, 12 years old when my grandfather passed away okay so uh, so the first few years were kind of fun with him nice. yeah nice and then uh, so magic was obviously involved but then also were you involved in some kind of sports or activities well you know uh, cricket was big you know right. right uh especially in high school mm-hmm. uh and i think yeah i think beyond that i think in in mumbai when i was growing up you're just very space constrained right, right? so no infrastructure so you yeah. you don't have that much room right uh in delhi we had more room and right. dubai we had more room and so that uh, that made uh cricket more possible uh in a more normal setting so right. so right. that's uh that's kind of really what i grew up with a uh, mix of cricket and soccer Okay. Do you still play or follow any of these? I I uh, follow the IPL. Okay. And so I think we have the we have got the season about to start soon. Yes. So uh, so that'll be great and I think they've done a great job with it. Yeah. Yeah, IPL is is huge. I mean, I don't follow it as much anymore, but yeah, that's that thing is just crazy and I think what I've heard is now even smaller cities are going in and creating their own teams pretty much like the the soccer leagues in Europe or, you know, the baseball teams out here. Yeah. It's Yeah I mean I think it's uh, you know the the cricket purists mm-hmm. uh will probably cringe at many of the rules yeah. but they've made it entertaining they've packaged right. it uh, yeah. well in a few hours and it works well yeah compared to the 5 day that's format. right that's yeah. right yeah okay so i had some rapid fire questions these are fun these are just you know just rapid fire sure right? so what is the strangest thing that you've ever eaten you've traveled around so what is the strangest one um Well, you know, uh, one time I I went to uh, I spent uh, uh, 3 days at the uh, Culinary Institute of America in mm-hmm. upstate New York with my daughter. Mm-hmm. She was at that time interested in being a chef, so we said we'll <laughs> spend a few days, you know, cooking with the chefs. And uh right when we arrived, they had us taste a number of mystery foods mm-hmm. and they didn't tell us what it was and they they asked us to eat it and then tell them what it was what you thought it was and uh, <laughs> you know how they say that everything tastes like chicken right <laughs> so uh, so to to me everything but then you know when they would come back and say okay this is you know uh, this part of the frog <laughs> and this is this part of the alligator and blah 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 <laughs> and uh, and such and so there was quite a range of oh. <laughs> of uh, things that we ate 
which I wouldn't have been able to eat <laughs> if I didn't know. If you knew. What yeah. It was. So, uh, but it, but you know, the chefs were great. It tasted great, <laughs> and uh, so that uh, that worked out pretty good. When well, one sitting, you had everything from a frog to an alligator. Yeah, it was just it was just awesome. because they just kept giving us the kind of small bites, right. and then they'd ask us what it was, and again another bite, and you just keep going. Wow. Yeah. So my first experience having sushi, I just went from having you know the the simplest to the sea urchin, the eggs, and like all the all the stuff. So, oh yeah. Okay. But yeah, I haven't experimented since. Well, that was fun. Uh, any scary dream? Scary dreams. You know, I think we all have uh, we all have scary dreams, uh, and most of the time I forget them. And, and <laughs> you know, I, I used to have a lot of dreams when I was younger. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Somehow we we don't dream as much when we're uh, mm-hmm. when we're older. Uh, but I'd have these dreams. There'd they'd be these uh, decoits on mm-hmm. uh, kind of uh, horseback Horses. coming. <laughs> And then they'd, you know, kidnap us and that sort of thing. You watched but too much show like growing up. I haven't seen, <laughs> I haven't had that dream in a while, which is good. But we'd have uh, quite a few of these vivid dreams when I was younger, yeah. What was your favorite character growing up? Um, you're talking about like a Hindi movie character or? Movie character or, a, you know, a cartoon Well, animation. you know, like a, a Phantom was always okay. big. Yeah. Uh, Mandrake. Yeah. You know, so I think usually those... Yeah. Uh, and then you know some of the uh, Amar Chitra Kathas, right? You know, I think uh, those those are, those Sabu are pretty good. Sabu and I think it was what Chacha Chacha Chaudhary. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. Uh, a thing that you own that you wish you didn't. I think. Well, uh, let me let me think about that for a second. <laughs> uh, I'll have to. Uh, there are very few regrets I have in life, so I'll come back. Let me just okay. digest that yeah. and think about what what I might be. Uh, what I might uh, want to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, in one sentence, uh, describe Pabrai Funds to us. Well, uh, Pabrai Funds is basically a a value investing, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, operation. We basically try to uh, it, it it only invests in public uh, stocks anywhere right. in the world. So we basically try to buy things that are undervalued, mm-hmm. uh, and we try to sell them when they approach uh, full price. So by no means is it kind of a trading operation. Right. I'd say in a year I might have three or four buy decisions, mm-hmm. three or four sell decisions. Mm-hmm. And uh, my job description at Pabrai Funds for the most part is reading. And mm-hmm. uh, there's very little activity, right. uh, but it's mostly reading, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I, I kind of saw that following, you know, the Warren Buffett model, you, you don't really... You're not a day trader, but there is still a lot of research that's done. But then you also don't have any analysts. Right. So uh, if you follow the Buffett approach, uh, one part of the approach that is critical is that you don't outsource right. any part of the investment mm-hmm. process. So uh, so if I were to have analysts, there'd be a couple of issues. One right. is uh, I wouldn't be able to know the businesses right. as well as I should. Mm-hmm. And the second is sometimes the analysts may be right, but because I don't, either it's outside my circle of competence or I don't understand uh, that area as well, I may reject an idea right. which may be a perfectly fine idea, so which right. is to some extent unfair. Right. And demotivating. But, yeah, so the right. thing is that uh, you know, the person comes up with something that, is, that makes sense and either it doesn't get the right weight mm-hmm. or it's not put in the portfolio at all. Right. So for good or bad, uh, the approach that Warren has taken is uh, not to delegate mm-hmm. uh, that aspect. And I think there's a very good reason uh, not to do that. And, and quite frankly, the thing is that um, it makes the business really simple mm-hmm. if you don't have people. Right. You know, so most businesses become complicated. Right. The biggest complication in businesses is people, right. and so one of the one of the kind of the elegance of the of the Pabrai fund models is that I just have uh, I have four part time assistants, mm-hmm. um, and you know they they work on Pabrai funds. They also work on our family foundation, right. but they uh, you know by two o'clock they're all gone, hmm. and um, and they don't have anything to do with investment research, so it works really well. You know that's it's a great setup. So, so do you use so going going into you know 
how things are changing with uh, artificial intelligence and and use of bots and other things have you used any such things to at least kind of get you to a point where then you can go in and start looking at you know i was also reading up on the there is the macro impact but then there is the micro impact and that's what the the buffett model kind of yeah so about. actually the the funny thing is that the investment process uh has not changed in in probably i would say since the time of ben graham i would say probably going back about 70 or 80 years mm-hmm. uh so in the last 70 or 80 years we've had a lot of technological change mm-hmm. but the value investing format and you know the modus operandi uh so the way warren buffett did in the 1950s and the way he does it today has hardly changed right. and so we have a lot more information we have a lot more speed mm-hmm. uh but for the most part that is irrelevant to the kind of work i'm trying to do so mm-hmm. uh the crux of the uh of the operation is that we don't have an information edge uh we've never had an information edge uh we have an analytics edge right and so um the information that i'm using or warren buffett is using is well known publicly available information right. and the speed at which that gets disseminated makes no difference so it used to take days right. now it takes seconds so that mm-hmm. has no bearing right. what has a bearing uh, is how you process that and the key is what uh, buffett's partner charlie munger calls right. the lattice work of mental model mm-hmm. so you bring in kind of a uh, life experience of different uh, understandings of the way the world works mm-hmm. and then that very rarely gives you an analytic edge and if that edge is big enough right. then it's enough to make an investment so kind of the economic mode yeah i mean basically mm-hmm. you're you're seeing things to a lens that's different than the lens that most investors are seeing right. things through mm-hmm. and that's what leads to the delta right and and such so that's and and that's what makes it fun is that uh, we're not really uh, playing with kind of you know unique information mm-hmm. uh, we're playing with unique insights right right makes sense yeah that's what makes you oh that's your unfair advantage yeah but the thing is that uh, like you know i think that uh, the founder of uh, of ibm used to say that uh, i'm i'm kind of smart in sports right. you know he doesn't know everything right. so uh, i don't know i don't have an edge in mm-hmm. probably 95% of stuff around the world things that are happening in the world but once in a while we do have an edge in a sliver of things mm-hmm. and that's all we focus on then you've known to be really humble so well. i take that with a grain of salt <laughs> <laughs> so you started this uh, i believe back in 99 that's right yes and you sold your company in 2000 so you had already started and i believe you heard about warren buffett like had what was like a around 94 before, 94 right? or so yes so how did that you know what was that process like you know now this has become your life's work what was that transition you you came from an it background as sure. an engineer so talk to us about you know that whole like 5 years and maybe two yeah, minutes yeah i think i think the the lesson i've learned is that many times in life we come to forks in the road mm-hmm. and when you come to forks in the road uh, you know uh, like robert frost said take the road less traveled uh, you yeah. generally do well so um i was uh, you know i was trained as an engineer i had an it services company mm-hmm. by accident quite by accident i picked up a book to read on a flight mm-hmm. and it happened to be uh, a a book on investing mm-hmm. which then for the first time led me to learn about warren buffett mm-hmm. and and then uh, uh, i was really fascinated by that subject uh, and i was lucky uh, just a couple of years before that the first couple of biographies on warren buffett had just mm-hmm. come out so i read those and that just opened up a whole new world and what was surprising to me at that time in 94 and that is still true today you know so this is the funny thing about uh, the slow pace <laughs> at which information moves is that uh, in 94 i noticed that 
very few practitioners of investing mm-hmm. in the world followed Buffett's approach to investing. And I also noticed that very few practitioners of investing had a record anything similar to Warren Buffett. So he had a unique approach and he had exceptional results. And I thought the two were correlated. Right. And what I found peculiar about the industry then and even today, it's been 23 years, mm-hmm. is that the industry uh, has not moved in the direction of becoming better. Uh, so the, the investing business, I think, is one of the only industries where incompetence is not only tolerated, it is rewarded. <laughs> so, for example, let's say I was a heart surgeon. Mm-hmm. And let's say I was a useless heart surgeon, you know, killing every second patient, <laughs> for example. Uh, very quickly, I'd be out of business right. and hopefully in jail. Right. Okay. That is not the case in the investment business. So in the investment business, professionals in the b- industry, 80 plus percent of them do worse than the index. Mm-hmm. And even after they do worse than the index, they have very high incomes. So this is uh, one, of the, one of the peculiarities of this business where... Uh, you have a rewarding of incompetence. Mm -hmm. And so what I noticed in 94 was that Warren had this unusual approach. Uh, That approach made a lot of sense to me when I read about it. And I found it very very strange that no one else followed that approach. So I said, okay, uh, we have this huge industry. We have this one small corner where this guy is beating the crap out of the the markets and the indices. Mm -hmm. And his approach makes sense. Nobody else is doing it. So I said, why don't I try? So I said, uh, I had about a million dollars extra. I just sold a portion of my business. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, what I'll do is I will try to replicate Buffett's approach uh, following that format. I want to see in real dollars and cents, what ends up happening. Right. Just kind of an experiment. And whether, whether, whether someone like me, who's not in the investment business, following that approach can actually beat the market and so on. And what ended up happening is that it worked extremely well. Mm-hmm. And it should work well because that framework is a very robust framework. Right. And uh, so I went from being fully immersed in the IT services business to being someone who was moonlighting, doing right. investment research. I was spending probably 15, 20 hours a week doing investment research. And I enjoyed, what I found is, I enjoyed those extracurricular hours right. far more than the business hours. So I finally asked myself one day, why do I spend my daytime hours in a format which is less than right. desirable? And so that's how I made the... So I spent about five years just uh, running my own portfolio. Mm-hmm. Then uh, Pabrai Funds got started with friends and family, mm-hmm. and then we grew from there. What was the first investment, like outside investment that you got, do you remember? Yeah, the, the first, uh, in fact, I, I remember it was the, uh, the very first investment was made on the first day the funds launched, oh. uh, which was actually like July 1st, 99, mm-hmm. and it was a, a bank, it was a bank in Silicon Valley called uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Mm -hmm. And it was a very interesting investment because at that time, if you remember, remember the dot-com bubble was in full full swing. I was skeptical about the bubble. Mm -hmm. And so Pabrai Funds never really invested, thankfully. In in (laughs) fact, in the first 12 months, we were up 70% and the markets had already crashed. Um, And the reason we we did that well was because we completely sidestepped. Um, so Silicon Valley Bank was an interesting bank because uh, they uh, used to take warrants. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it was based in Silicon Valley. They used to take warrants from all these companies when they made loans to them. Mm-hmm. And so they were sitting on this pool of hundreds and hundreds of companies of warrants, which could be very valuable if some of these companies started going public. And at that time, there were a lot of IPOs happening. Right. So that whole pool of warrants was available for free. Hmm. It was not in the stock price. And I felt that the bank was a good, stable bank, Mm -hmm. uh, but we had upside, which was unknown and uncapped, really. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we did that. So actually, I think we held the position uh, for a couple of years. I think we made about three or four times our money on it. Uh, So so it worked out. And, And it did well because... 
uh, a few months after we bought, they started to monetize mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, bring out Actually, the value. Right. And uh, that was part of the thesis is that we had a base business that we right. were paying for mm-hmm. and getting all this upside for free. Nice. So once you sold the company and, and you exited for a pretty you know decent amount, did you pool all of those resources into Pabrai funds or was that invested someplace else? Um, I think when, when Pabrai Fund started, it started with a million dollars and I put in a uh, hundred thousand okay. dollars and I have never, I, I, I have never added anything wow. to that hundred thousand. It's in the tens of millions now because <laughs> right, of right. Uh, the great fee structures and such. Thank you, Warren. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, no, so I, I basically had to find a way to uh, to live and support the family and right. so on. So basically, Pabrai Fund didn't, the fee structure was one mm-hmm. where I would make a lot of money in some years and make, could make zero in other right. years and, uh, and kind of we take it from there. So Interesting. So Warren, Warren has, uh, you know, a lot of the, his companies that are cash flow. You know, so there's from Geico all the way sure. to Seas Candy. And he uses that to reinvest and you know get these stakes. Outside of investors, how do you kind of like where is the where is your funding coming from? Um, well, you know the the capital is grown. I mean, I, I mean, I would say that in uh, in the last uh, seventeen odd years, I think uh, you know the money's gone up like twelve x or something right. in that in that period. Mm-hmm. So clearly, that's uh, right. that's that's grown it, and we are. Uh, you know, Warren has these permanent vehicles. You know, right. like uh, like Geico and C's. Right. Uh, we we have all public companies that get bought and sold. Right. So uh, basically, we manage uh, Pabrai Funds has five hundred odd million. Right. So those investments over time do get sold, right. and that and, uh, money gets recycled, recycled into the next investment okay. and so on. So we have a book uh, question. What's the book name that has uh, Warren's strategy? The, the couple of books that you mentioned earlier on, what are the names of the books? Yeah, so, uh, so I think the best biography, uh, and I read this in 94, was uh, written by Roger Lowenstein. It's mm-hmm. called Buffett, The Making of an American Capitalist. Right. I think that's a great biography. Uh, now they have the Berkshire Hathaway letters right. to shareholders. They have it on right. Amazon from 1965. Right. So you have 50 years of those, which are also right. wonderful. And they're like 20 bucks or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the friend of mine who put that together, he's in the Bay Area. So, uh, so the best things in life are free right. or nearly free. Or nearly free. Yeah. I think for, uh, for 40 bucks, you could be <laughs> right. well on your way. <laughs> right. Okay. So, yeah. And we'll post those uh, on the comments in the, in the show later on. Um, so just kind of looking at, you know, the, the performance and, and how a value investor is kind of tracked based on a number of years compared to a day trader who's kind of going from one day trade to another. Is it more difficult for a value investor to kind of make a comeback compared to a day trader? Well, I mean, we're, we're going to have our ups and downs. Right. I've, I've had uh, my downs as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the bottom line is you stay true to yourself right. and you stay true to your process. Uh, the very best investors are going to be wrong one out of three times. Sure. So this is a business where we are making forecasts about the future. Mm-hmm. By definition, that's a risky business. Right. And uh, we're not going to always be right about those forecasts. Right. And, but the, the good thing about this business is that even with a uh, 30% error rate, when mm-hmm. things don't go the way you expected, uh, you will still be able to beat the market. Right. And uh, even even if you beat the market by small percentages, uh, the that that adds up over time because right. compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. Right. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we know you have a love-hate relationship with auto and airline industries. Sure. And you have invested in them and they've done pretty well. Southwest is one example where I think I was listening in on one of your interviews you got in at like somewhere in the in the 30s and now mm-hmm. it's like mid 50s almost touching 60s so w- what gets you you know and and when do you think that cycle might end if or you might exit well so actually we uh, it's we were somewhat lucky 
I think the Southwest move has happened in less than six months, mm -hmm. in four or five months, which right. is uh, uh, far better than average for me, right. if you will. Yes. Uh, we don't see those sorts of moves that right. quickly in most of my investments. Right. But the thing is that if you if you had invested in Southwest Airlines even 20 years ago or 30 mm -hmm. years ago, uh, uh, you would have beaten the market right. by quite a margin. Right. In fact, from the time they've gone public, they've beaten Berkshire Hathaway. Yes. And, and it's an airline. It's right. an airline in a crappy industry right. uh, where you know, your dumbest competitor sets your price right. and you have no control over fuel costs right. and you're regulated and you have to buy your product from mm -hmm. a duopoly right. uh, and you have to have engines uh, serviced by a duopoly. Mm -hmm. It's all kinds of ugliness in right. that industry. With all of that, Southwest still did really well. And they're the only ones. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the only, uh, I think they, they're the only US airline that has never lost money right. uh, in the entire existence. They mm -hmm. may have had a, a quarter in 2008 or something, but, but they've been, which is an amazing, right. all the other competitors have had chapter 11, chapter right. 22, chapter yeah. 20, 33, right. you know, they've, right. they've gone in and out of bankruptcy <laughs> multiple times. Right. Um, and the reason for that is that Southwest is a company with a very unusual culture. Right. And, you know, uh, when, when, I, when I travel Southwest in coach, Mm -hmm. I find myself in a better mood right. than business on United. Yeah. And uh, that's quite, quite stunning. Yeah, it's just a happy airline. It's yeah. a happy airline. They're yeah. telling jokes. Right. Uh, it's a fun place to yeah. be. And uh, that's quite a powerful moat. So, yeah. uh, so I don't know how long we'll own Southwest, uh, but uh, I, love, I love the airline yeah. and I love the way it's run and I love flying it. So, right. so talking about you know, the, the culture and finding these modes, how does branding and marketing also kind of play into your decisions when, you, when you're looking at these companies to invest or divest from? Yeah, so, you know, Southwest is a good example. The thing is that the, the culture of the place doesn't become obvious from just reading their financial reports. Right. So, uh, I think the thing is there's a number of biographies on Herb Kelleher. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some Harvard case studies. So I think if you did a deeper dive mm -hmm. into the airline industry, uh, and you kind of understand kind of how the business works, what you'll find is that Southwest took all the disadvantages of the industry mm -hmm. and converted them into advantages. Right. Right. So what they, what they did is, so for example, the airplane. Mm -hmm. The airplane is a very costly asset, and it's, it's, you know, north of 100 million. Well, they fly their planes for 15, 16 hours a day. Mm -hmm. That airplane's on the ground for less than 25 minutes. Right. Compared to and like two hours for Yeah, others. exactly. Right. And they're just, you know, rapid fire right. recycling those planes. And they're short haul. Uh, and they always focused on uh, making it more efficient than driving. Right. So they never thought United was their competitor. Mm -hmm. They thought you driving your own car was it's the competitor. Right. And so, so they framed the product, uh, pro the problem differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, what ends up happening is that when you take that expensive asset, but you use it in this format, their return on assets and return on equity is like a software company. Right. It's incredible. They, mm -hmm. they generate very high returns and none of the other airlines are able to do that. And right. none of the other airlines are able to copy. So your competitors can copy everything they cannot copy your culture. Right. And so the Southwest culture mm -hmm. is really its biggest strength. And all the competitors, United set up TED, Delta yeah. set up Song, right. all of the competitors tried Trying, right. and they shut them down. Right. They couldn't compete. Mm -hmm. So that's a very durable moat. Okay. Uh, looks like we have another question. So is there a difference in value investing compared to just simple long-term investing? Well, all, all intelligent investing is value investing. Okay. So if you're, if you're investing, what you, the, the very you know, basics of investing is to buy an asset for less than what it's worth. Mm -hmm. so, so for example, uh, I mean, let's say I'm in, I'm in India and let's say I look at um, a great company like HDFC Bank. Right. HDFC Bank is a very well-run mm -hmm. bank and done really well. And if you, if you had held it for a long time, you've done really well. But it's not obvious if you buy it today and you hold it for another 20 years, where, whether that is the best 
possible investment you could right. make. It's fully priced. Now it mm-hmm. may continue to do well, may continue to beat the markets, but there are likely other that businesses. So what you might what you might do better with is to find a kind of a, a diamond in the rough mm-hmm. or something that's more earlier stage right. where you are able to figure out the trajectories. And, um, and those may end up being better. So long-term investing is simply, is, is definitely better than day trading. Right. Uh, the worst you could do is day trading. Day trade. um, <laughs> I would say that if you're a long-term investor who's not particularly looking at valuations, then indexing is a better way to go. Right. Uh, but if you're able to figure out values of businesses, mm-hmm. then value investing That's becomes a best. no-brainer. Yeah. So talking about companies in India, how has being Indian impacted your business, your success? Has it been positive or has it been not as positive? Uh, no, I think it's been positive. I think uh, anytime we are transplanted into different cultures, it gives us an advantage. I think... Uh, more recently, uh, I find that, uh, you know, I was just looking at my portfolio the other day and it surprised me that something like uh, nearly 40% of the pie mm-hmm. is invested outside the U.S. And in fact, if I were to include, uh, if I were to include a Fiat Chrysler in that mm-hmm. mix, which is a right. half Italian, right. half American company, it might be north of 50% of the pie. Oh. And uh, India is almost 20 percent uh, which is amongst the highest it's ever been for us mm-hmm. and I can see it becoming 30 or even 40 percent because uh, for the last uh, quite a while I haven't found much in the US I think Southwest was right. one of the anomalies we mm-hmm. found uh, but we're able to find more things in India so I, I think it's a better pond to fish in mm-hmm. in 2017 uh, than the U.S. public equities pond. Makes sense. So outside of Pabrai funds, do you invest in other startups or investors? Yeah, so I don't, I don't do startups. Uh, we, I have another company, Thando Holdings, right. uh, which buys private assets. We own an insurance company. Mm-hmm. But it, it tends to focus on uh, well-established businesses, mm-hmm. uh, which have had some history and such. So... Generally speaking, uh, I have no edge with startups, <laughs> and so I try to stay away from things where Which is interesting I don't have an edge. You had your own startup. Yeah, so I think I think uh, yeah, so I think you can say that I've had a lot of experience with startups. I've also had a lot of failures with startups. <laughs> uh, but the good thing with startups is that if you had ten failures and one success, right. uh, you would be very successful. Right. And uh, so the the failures don't cost you much. Mm-hmm. And the, so there's an asymmetric reward. Right. And, uh, and that's what's worked well for me is that uh, we've had a few that hasn't, haven't worked. But at, at some point, Pabrai Funds was a startup. It worked. Uh, Transtech was a startup. Mm-hmm. It worked. Uh, Dando Holdings was a startup. Mm-hmm. It worked. And even the foundation we have, Dakshana, Dakshana was a startup. And that worked as well. So. so talking about Dakshana, you know, I kind of tend to ask this to most of the guests we interview. So... You know, from hustling, making, and, and making more, uh, coming to a stage where, you know, you're starting to give things away. And, and you've been doing Dakshana for, for as long as, you know, you've been involved with uh, money making, I think. So what's your, what's your philosophy on philanthropy? Well, the, the thing is, there are a few things that are kind of laws of nature. Number mm-hmm. one, we don't live forever. Right. Uh, so as much as I hate the idea, I'm going to be gone one day. <laughs> and number two... Um, large inheritances are a disservice to our next generation. Mm-hmm. So uh, in general, if, if you're going to pass on large amounts to your gene pool, uh, you're going to take away their ability to achieve maximized potential. Right. So it actually does more harm than good. And uh, so quite frankly, the most enlightened and only choice available, because you can't give it to your gene pool, right. uh, is to recycle it back to society. Yeah. And recycling back to society has uh, has some challenges. In fact, I found Dakshana to be more challenging than any of our any of the capitalist ventures, mm-hmm. 
but it's also been far more fulfilling. Right. Right. And so it's it's now been I'm surprised it's been ten years, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm I'm very uh, uh, very grateful that uh, that I actually was able to start this uh, when we started it, and that was able to get the traction and scaling that it did. So it's 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 just been. Uh, my life would be worse, far worse without Dakshana. Yeah. And for those who don't know, Dakshana, and, and I don't want to butcher this, but you help talented kids go to IITs. Yeah, in, we, in we find, we find uh, kids who are impoverished, but they're very right. bright. Right. And uh, we just take away the, the, the financial friction. shackles, right. if you will. Yeah. Right. So people would hate me if I didn't ask you this. There is, there's this bust of Warren Buffett. Uh, and the bust of Charlie Munger. Oh, sorry. that's, uh, that's yeah. Uh, yeah, Buffett's, yeah. Uh, Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger. Yes. And, but you have another one in, in the other office. Yeah. For Buffett. So, and then you have this amazing collection of uh, Ganeshas. So what's the Well, you know, uh, I'm kind of between atheist and agnostic <laughs> uh, in my religious beliefs. Um, but uh, one of the good things about growing up as a Hindu is uh, you get to pick your gods, right. which is great. Most yeah. religions don't yep. like to pick your gods. <laughs> And so I, I like I like Ganesh from when I was very young. Yep. He's kind of a cool guy. Yep. He's a cool god. <laughs> He's also the god of prosperity. Right. We care about prosperity. So <laughs> uh, just in my travels, anytime I'd find an unusual Ganesh, I'd buy it. And some of them have been gifted over, over the years. So, uh, so we just put them together and it's kind of fun to hang out with Ganesh. Nice. So one Warren Buffett question, and, and we got the, the 35 minute mark, so if, if you're okay with a, a minute or two. Sure, sure. I know Warren Buffett is, he's a curious guy and he's somewhat eccentric, eccentric, right? So what things have you learned from him outside of his investment strategies? Are there things that you've learned or habits that you have picked up from him? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we bribed him and we had lunch with him. Right in uh, 2008, I would say the best things about Warren Buffett have nothing to do with investing. Right. They have everything to do with leading a great life. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, uh, I think one of the things that Warren focuses a lot on, which I think is a really good framework, is he does not live his life based on an external scorecard. Right. Uh, he does not care what people think mm -hmm. of him. He lives his life based on an inner scorecard. Yes. And so I think this focus on an inner scorecard is a tremendous uh, competitive advantage if we adopt it. I've tried to adopt it. Right. So, uh, you know, there's a saying in Hindi, uh, I think there's a, there's a song, Kuch to log kahenge, long ka kaam hai kehna. So bottom line is ignore the world and ignore the people of the world and pursue your passions. Right and do the best that you can do mm -hmm. in the areas that you're most passionate about and you're bound to be successful. Yes. And uh, so that's, that's uh, kind of uh, one, of the, one of the important lessons I've taken is to forget, figure out who you are right. and then maximize based on that. Yeah. And I also read he eats what, he doesn't eat what he wouldn't have eaten as a... Kid. Yeah, that's right. right. He eats what he ate as a five-year-old. Right. <laughs> that's right. It's really interesting. Right. <laughs> So this investment that you made, and, and I don't know if you saw any of our ads going out, but one of the things I analyzed was the 650000 if you had invested that in Berkshire Hathaway, would have been about $1.7, $1.8 million today. Sure. So did that pay off? And I know you kind of did. Have well, I think, I think that uh, my wife says that when we were first going to bid on the lunch, she thought it was kind of very strange. <laughs> Uh, now she says that it's probably the best possible investment I could ever made. And I have to say that uh, in hindsight, uh, I would have been willing to pay a lot more. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's led to many wonderful things in our lives. It's led to a, a very warm friendship with Warren, yes. uh, with his uh, partner, Charlie, Charlie. Munger. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I play bridge with Charlie. Yes. And it's it's added a richness to the lives of my uh, my kids and mm -hmm. my my family. Uh, my kids were, I think, 10 and 12 years old when right. they went for that lunch. Yeah. And uh, so Warren gave them a bunch of uh, insights as well. And they remember those. Mm -hmm. And they uh, I think they'll execute on those. Nice. So I think in many ways, like the MasterCard ads, mm -hmm. it was priceless. Right. You know, it was right. just great. 
Amazing. So, any practical or philosophical advice for entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs, the things that you've learned to do or not do? Well, I think that, uh, you know, we have, uh, for entrepreneurs, I would just say that uh, the important thing is to try to build sustainable businesses. Uh, don't think of businesses with exits in mind right. and IPOs in mind mm -hmm. or any of those things. Think of building businesses that will stay in your family for 100 years. Mm -hmm. And think of, think of building uh, sustainable businesses that leverage your uh, strongest passions. Right. And I think if, if you pursue that, then the world's your oyster. Awesome. Well, thank you, Munish, on that note. And uh, thank you for everyone for watching us. I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, Abacus Human Capital Management, Atlas Hospitality, Bombay Made, Sea Castle Insurance, and last but not the least, MSI Stone. Till the next show, see you guys.